Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today's guest is Dr. Matt Binniger, the Director of our Clinical Virology Laboratory and the Vice Chair of Practice for the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Binniger, to Answers from the Lab. It's great to have you back to discuss a very timely topic of respiratory virus infections. Thanks, Dr. Pritt. It's always good to be here. So I thought we would start with influenza because we're starting to see uh, media and talk about getting your flu shot for the year. So every fall season, we see this uptick in influenza cases across the U.S. What are we seeing so far? Yeah, it's uh, coming up on flu season. And last year, we had a very early flu season where nationwide we peaked out in middle to late November. So we'll have to see if that happens again this year. We are seeing some sporadic flu activity, although it's very low in the United States. I think in the state of Texas, they're seeing some uh, moderate influenza activity, but most of the other states in the nation are still low flu activity. I would guess though, that in the coming two to three weeks, we'll start to see more influenza cases nationwide. And again, it's always a question of whether we'll have an early flu season like we did last year, or more typical influenza season where we see peak cases in January. Interesting. It's always so hard to predict, isn't it? It is. Well, could you remind everyone about the different types of tests we have to diagnose influenza? Absolutely. So most patients who come down with an influenza-like illness will need to go in and have a swab collected by their healthcare provider for a lab-based flu test. Unlike COVID, where we now have many different antigen at-home tests available for COVID-19. That's not the case for influenza. There aren't at-home antigen tests that we can readily just go out to a pharmacy and get and take home. There are uh, tests that are in development for at-home flu testing, and there is one over-the-counter influenza and COVID molecular test that you can, uh, if you're lucky enough to find it, uh, get it and take it home and perform that test, but it's not nearly as readily available as the COVID-19 antigen test. So most patients will need to go in, have a swab, and get a PCR-based test that usually looks for COVID and RSV, and in some cases, COVID-19 as well. Yeah, it'll be really nice to have more of those readily available point of care tests or over the counter tests that people can bring home. I think with COVID, we definitely saw people getting very used to using those tests. So we'll have to keep an eye and see what happens with those. <laughs> so you raised an interesting point about the new test that is available to test for COVID and influenza that people can buy at a pharmacy or drugstore if they're lucky enough to find it. Is there a concern that someone would have both of these viruses at the same time? It is possible for a person to be co-infected with influenza and COVID-19. Uh, it's not extremely common, but we have seen individuals test positive for both viruses. It's mm. also possible to have COVID-19 and RSV or COVID-19 and another respiratory virus. So sometimes testing uh, we'll need to look for multiple viruses to determine exactly what the patient has. Yeah, that makes sense. And so I guess speaking of other respiratory viruses, let's move on to some others. Why don't we talk about RSV next? That's another respiratory virus that we've spoken about in the past, and it's been on the news quite a bit. So can you tell us what RSV is? Yes, RSV is, stands for Respiratory Syncytial Virus. And for years, it's been thought to be uh, an important cause of respiratory disease in young children. It's actually one of the leading causes of visits to the emergency department and hospitalization among young children. But now we know that can also cause serious disease in uh, older individuals, as well as those with a suppressed immune system. 
And this has been a big year for RSV because for the first time, there are now vaccines available uh, specifically for the elderly and then a new um, therapy, kind of like a vaccine that can be given to young children that provides them with five to six months of protection against RSV. And so it's recommended for uh, children that are entering into their uh, first or uh, respiratory season where they might encounter RSV. So again, some uh, breaking news with regards to treatment and prevention of RSV this year. Yeah, that's really great news, having vaccines for all of the primary respiratory viruses that you would be concerned about having severe disease with, RSV, influenza, COVID. So good news for us. Um, how is RSV spread? And then maybe you could also tell us how it's diagnosed. For sure. So RSV is spread in a similar way as to influenza and COVID-19. So it's a, a virus that's spread through respiratory droplets. So coughing, sneezing are the primary means of spreading the virus. But it also can be spread through what we call fomites, which are inanimate objects like a piece of tissue or someone who might cough into their hand and then touch a door handle. If someone comes along and touches that contaminated door handle or a tissue and then rubs their eyes or puts their hand in their nose or mouth, that virus can be spread through those means as well. And we test for RSV in a similar fashion as we would for influenza and COVID-19. And as I mentioned earlier, it's oftentimes included in the same test that we look for influenza in. So many of the test manufacturers have grouped together influenza and RSV into the same PCR test. And then there are some that even include COVID-19. So you can go and get a test for flu, RSV and COVID-19 at some laboratories in the country. Well, that's great. Let's move on to the last of the three viruses, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19. So COVID's still making the news. We're hearing about it more. We're talking about maybe wearing masks in certain situations again. So what are we seeing over overall? Is COVID surging? Yeah, three and a half years after the pandemic started and we're still talking about COVID-19. Um, it is surging and causing increases a number of cases in many parts of the country. Um, and I anticipate that we'll continue to see more cases, more hospitalizations over the fall and winter months as we typically do for respiratory viruses. Here's the issue. The virus has mutated significantly from when the last vaccines were uh, developed and, and given so that those who have been vaccinated in the past are susceptible to being reinfected or having a, an infection with these new circulating variants. And so the good news is that there has been a significant update to the vaccine. Uh, and the updated vaccines now include a more recent strain of the virus that produces an immune response that should protect us uh, from coming down with uh, a serious illness uh, caused by these new circulating strains. So again, increased number of cases and I anticipate we'll continue to see more as we move into the cooler months. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Vinegar. We mentioned testing for the other two viruses. So can you give us an overview of the different types of tests for COVID-19? You had already said that we have a lot of at-home antigen tests. Mm -hmm. So could you also tell us when you would use one of those versus a test in the laboratory? Yeah, we've got a large number of tools in our diagnostic toolbox for COVID-19, uh, for sure. Spanning from at-home antigen tests, there are a few at-home molecular PCR-based tests. There are point-of-care tests that you can get at urgent care clinics or the emergency department. And then there are the lab-based PCR tests. So really the full spectrum of, of diagnostic tests that either look for COVID-19 alone or COVID in combination with influenza and RSV. Now, when would you wanna use one test or another? So if you uh, come down with a respiratory illness, so if you've developed a cough, sore throat, body aches, and you have an at-home antigen test for COVID-19 or access to one, I recommend that you take one. 
if that test is positive, you likely have COVID-19 and you should uh, stay at home, uh, isolate yourself from others for at least five days. If that test is negative, though, and your symptoms continue, I think it's a good idea to go in and see your healthcare provider and get a swab collected that can be tested in the lab by a very sensitive PCR-based test. Another situation where you might want to consider testing is if you've come into contact or had exposure to someone who has a confirmed case of COVID-19. You might want to test over a period of five days to see if you've contracted the illness. And then the third scenario is if you're going to be interacting with someone who has a, a severely suppressed immune system, like someone with cancer. So if you're going to get together with a, a family member or a friend who has cancer or takes medications to suppress their immune system, not a bad idea to take a COVID-19 antigen test right before you get together with them. That way you can catch a potential infection and, and if you're positive, prevent um, spreading that to a, a susceptible individual. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's a nice, just extra measure for uh, feeling confident that you're going to be okay to be with that individual. Right. So a lot of us still have COVID tests at home uh, that we've received perhaps years ago now. Are they still good? Uh, I know that I have some in my closet that are probably expired. Yeah, uh, we've all accumulated many of these tests over the last three and a half years. The good news is that the expiration date that's on those tests may not actually be the most current expiration date. What do I mean by that? Well, when the test manufacturers rush to put these tests together and, and have them for um, uh, purchase at uh, pharmacies, uh, during the early days of the pandemic, they had to come up with a relatively arbitrary ex uh, expiration date. Now that we're three and a half years in, the companies have had a lot longer period of time to determine how good these tests are good for. And so they've, uh, in many situations, come up with extended expiration dates that are now published on the FDA website. So if you've got a test at home, the first thing that I would recommend is if you have an expiration date on that test that is passed, to go onto the FDA website, you can Google FDA COVID extended expiration, and there's a link and it will show the various uh, companies that develop uh, COVID-19 antigen tests and which um, expiration dates have been extended. So that's a, a good thing that people can do to determine whether their tests are still usable or not. Well, that's really good advice, and we probably should all check check out that website. I know um, for my expired test, if they're still usable, then it would be nice to have them available. For sure. So now I'm going to ask you the same question I asked for the other two viruses. What do you expect to see in the coming months for COVID cases? Yeah, unfortunately, the CDC published in early September that the number of COVID-related hospitalizations and deaths are on the rise nationwide. Mm -hmm. Again, we've got these more uh, infectious variants that are circulating. In most cases, uh, people's immune system, either from prior infection or prior vaccines, are keeping them from getting really sick. But in some cases, uh, people are ending up in the hospital and worst uh, case scenario, dying from that infection. As we enter into the winter months, the temperatures get colder, people's immune systems typically aren't as strong as they are in other times of the year. Respiratory viruses spread uh, better in the winter months. We'll probably see more COVID-19 cases, which will lead to more people ending up in the hospital. So it'll be really important to get those updated COVID-19 vaccines uh, when you can. Yeah, that's really great advice. Um... What other measures can we take to reduce our risk for all of these respiratory viruses we just discussed? Yeah, and fortunately, there are some really simple things that we can do to not only disrupt COVID-19 transmission, but flu mm -hmm. and RSV as well. So you can wear a mask. If you have any symptoms at all, uh, you should wear a mask. Better yet, just stay home if you're not feeling well. Uh, washing your hands. As I mentioned, these respiratory viruses are uh, often spread through coughing and sneezing. But if you 
touch something that's contaminated with one of these viruses and then uh, touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, you can become infected through that route. So washing your hands is a really critical step. And then we have vaccines now for these, especially for flu and COVID. Get those vaccines when you can. And if you're in one of the populations where the RSV vaccine is approved, consider getting the RSV vaccine as well. Yeah, great advice. Well, a lot of wonderful updates and insights. Thank you again, Dr. Vinegar, for joining us and for all of this great information. I'm sure we will have you back on a future episode. Talk to you later. Thanks, Dr. Pritz. Always good to be here. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.